to the Dear Katie podcast. This is Katie Kessner. I am the woman who was on the cover of Time Magazine at age 18 as the very first in history to have spoken out nationally and publicly as the victim of date rape. And now having traveled coast to coast around the globe, lectured at over 5,000 institutions, I am pleased to be um, sharing my story and the story of survivors with all of you listening. And I am co-hosting with Claire Kaplan. Claire, could you share a little bit about your background? Hi, everyone. My name is Claire Kaplan, and I uh, recently retired from the University of Virginia. I've worked in the anti-violence movement for close to 40 years, which is hard to believe, and largely as an advocate for survivors. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Claire, for being here as well. And greetings and thank you for all of you joining us for our podcast tonight. Before we start, we definitely want to remind you that this content can be emotionally challenging, difficult for anyone, and potentially triggering for those of us who have been through trauma ourselves. So please do not hesitate to reach out for support if you need to at any point um, during or after this session, whether you reach out to friends, family, anonymous hotlines, websites, books, poetry, journaling, and we will talk a little bit about additional resources at the end of this session. So we're going to start out by reading one of the Dear Katie letters I have received and hopefully hear from another powerful survivor in a moment. Katie, November 1996. If I can remove the bonds of shame which have kept me silently raging against these crimes, I too will shoulder the burden, the responsibility to be my brother's keeper and carry the message to him and fulfill a promise to all my sisters. I refuse to ignore the crimes, which are so obviously wrong. I will be silent no longer. So tonight we are so excited to welcome another incredible survivor. Dina sent in her personal story and is now ready to share it with the world. So Dina, so pleased to have you with us um, to share your journey and your experience. Welcome. Thank you, Katie and Claire. Yes, and also I want to add, welcome to our listeners. We're really grateful for your presence and for bearing witness to the testimony that you will hear this evening. And thank you again to Dina for sharing your vulnerability and strength with us and with the world. Absolutely. So Dina, let's start with a little context for our listeners. Um, Where are you from? Where did you grow up? Tell us a little bit about you. Sure. Well, I'm 68. I'm a um, white and I'm Jewish and I'm a member um, of a pretty large family, grandmother, mother, wife. Um, I work as a teacher, a painter, uh, a poet um, in Pennsylvania. Thank you so much. And, and then again, so let's start at the beginning of this journey for you. Um, what experience is it that has brought you here today? Yes, well, um, I also was am a survivor of a date rape um, that happened 50 years ago. So in 1971, I was a senior in a big suburban high school in New Jersey. Give you a picture, there were more than 600 kids in my class. It was the middle of the, the Vietnam War. Um, political knowledge of feminism was coming into our consciousness um, our, our, our heroines were Gloria Steinem, Betty Friedan, Shirley Chisholm. Um, but my town was uh, in New Jersey was, hadn't really changed with the times too much. So things like we had been given permit, the women in our high school were given permission to wear pants to school in our, in our junior year. And people, the teachers were still like measuring our skirts. It was, there were a lot of very old fashioned um, customs in those days. Wow, that's very vivid, very vivid, Dina. And um, what kind of size school did you go to? Did, you know, was it a big high school, little public? Yeah, yeah, a, a rat, a really big public high school, um, about half an hour commute to New York City. Um, I was a serious artsy student who loved to write poems and draw. You know, we had big sports in our high school, but I was into the arts. Great. And so what what happened? Well, um, so I was um, 
pretty inexperienced with dating and boyfriends. But in my senior year of high school, my girlfriends and I went to a big dance at another high school. And I met a boy um, who I started to date. He was a little older than I. Uh, He'd been to college for a year and was back home working and living with his family. And I started to date him. I I dated him for about a month, kind of like a a movie set, you know, kind of what you'd see on sitcoms in those days. You know, he'd come to the house. He had a convertible that he had worked on. He was very proud of. He would charm my parents. We'd go out, you know, for ice cream. We'd drive around in his convertible listening to music, you know, like um, like Marvin oh my Gaye, goodness. you know, Three Dog Night. That does like sound that. like, you, yeah, you those, sound those. like you are writing a script for a movie right now. I know. So all seemed really great, um, but I was pretty inexperienced. And one day um, he invited me to come to his family home to meet his parents they were wealthy, lived in another town. And I went and um, we were going to go swimming. He said he was going to invite some friends over. He had a big pool in the backyard. So I did meet his parents and brother and sister. Um, and then we went to swim in the backyard. No friends came. And I said, you know, what's happening? He said, oh, they're not here yet. And when I went into the basement, you know, to get a towel, get changed, that's when he came came in after me, and he knew his family was leaving the house, and he raped me there in, in the basement. Oh, my goodness. And I thought, you know, I thought it was pretty violent, um, you know, and he succeeded. So that's what happened. That sounds really scary. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, immediately afterward, I'm curious, did how, you, he had driven you there. How did you get home? Right. So it w- I was kind of in shock, um, and but I demanded he drive me home, which he did. You know, years later, I thought about this a lot. I think he was taking, dr- you know, uppers and fenomenes. I didn't know much about the drug world, but he... He was always very fast talking, impulsive, kind of an exciting guy, um, and just so speedy in everything he did. Later, I think that's what he was doing. Um, He did drive me home. And so I didn't tell anyone in my family. I, at the time, you know, I was really in shock. And my, I kind of, thought my body had let me down. I I didn't, I couldn't talk him out of it. I, you know, screamed and fought. I, I had this sense that my body didn't protect me and I did feel ashamed. And I, I think that's not an unusual uh, feeling. So I hid what was going on from my family at first, although my behaviors changed. So I turned within in a lot of ways, you know, took constant showers, stopped eating very much, wouldn't talk on the phone to people, was dressing with lots of layers, um, very anxious, couldn't focus. So I had been a dance student on a serious one. I used to go into New York City on weekends and study at a famous modern dance company. That would have been my goal, you know, that that career. But I, I kind of stopped that. So I went within. And so it was, I hid it from everybody. And then after about a month or a month and a half, I think my body body shut, shut down in a lot of ways. I didn't get my period. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, I might be pregnant. So I told my mother. And she took me to a gynecologist and I wasn't pregnant. And that, that was the first person I told. Dina, I want to go back to one thing you said. I liked when you said my body didn't protect me. And I think that there's a little more explanation because it's a sense that um, somehow our physical selves could ward off a rapist. And I, I like thinking about what that means for so many of us that we have this frailty to our body. What does it mean to you when you said that? It, it happened in terms of the action that happened. I mean, I could not stop it. So I, I could not prevent him from, um, you know, doing the rape. And I also couldn't talk him out of it. 
um, either either when I was I was calmly talking to him. I mean, I knew him, and I then physically fought him. So the physicality of that and kind of my hope that it wouldn't happen as it was unfolding was just it was like being in a bad movie. I'm thinking about the body versus the brain because you also said you want you couldn't talk him out of it. And for some of our survivors, you know, they've been not all brain there. You know, they were passed out at the time, but you were full brain present. Um, how how yes. do you juxtapose the brain frailty with the body frailty? Um, you know, does one bother you more than the other or have you come to terms with both? Yes, that's so interesting. What an interesting question. Um, it took me much longer to come to terms with the mind prevention. Um, so he was bigger. And so, you know, I understood that in my body later and at the time. Um, so that made sense. Um, but what compounded my sense of that I might have let myself down was my mother's reaction. So I think it was very cultural. There was nothing at the time. I didn't even have a word for what had happened. We didn't know the word date rape. There was a girl we knew who had been raped that spring, um, attacked by a stranger as she was walking home alone at night. It's almost a trope. We've all kind of heard of that, you know, read about it in literature. But what happened to me, you know, I wasn't sure what that was. When I, conf you know, confided in my mom, she was furious and I think she was ill-equipped. She had no idea how to be supportive. She was Such a thing, if it got out, would bring shame to the family. Furious with you or furious with the guy? With me. Um, and accused me of not using my intelligence to avoid such a thing. Perhaps I had been put myself in a vulnerable position. Right, which is very typical of that. Well, it's typical still, but in that time, right, Dave rape or Queen's rape was just not something people were talking about. It's too bad that she couldn't be there for you, but it's understandable too at the, at, during that time. Yes, it, add, it added to the, the difficulty of the trauma and the healing later. Although I will say that I did forgive her, but that I was very estranged from her and cut off, cut myself off, didn't trust her as well as males, you know, at that point. Um, yeah, which raises the next question, which is, um, so what was the aftermath for you um, subsequently? I mean, what was... How did, what were some of the resp uh, responses that you had emotionally, um, physically in your life? Yes. Well, it, it, it's been a journey for sure. And, and many years that I've been able to make this journey. Um, something amazing happened. I, I, went, I went away for the summer. I had plans to go work somewhere and I did do that. So he apparently had been calling the house all summer after I left. I refused to uh, speak to him and I, at that point. And it occurred to me, you know, that what happened really was rape. I just knew it. And I was sure of it. So when I came back home, which was the end of August that year, we called and I, I confronted him. It's a, I don't know why I did that. And I'm very glad I did. So I told him that I would meet with him and talk with him. And I, I told one of my girlfriends that I was breaking up with my boyfriend. And she, and my girlfriends didn't know my story. I said, he's a jerk. I'm going to break up with him. But this is what I want you to do. Um, there's a big park in our town and with trees around and people going through, lots of stores lining a large park, churches, very well populated and benches. And I can picture this. So I asked my friend to sit on a bench kind of nearby. And I said, I'm meeting this guy here. And I just want you to be there for moral support. When he did come, I s confronted him. I don't know exactly what I said now, because it's 50 years ago. I know I said to him, what you did was rape me. And, you know, that's terrible. And you should know that. And you're lucky I didn't call the cops. But you, you need to understand this and how much it hurt me. And he, his narrative was, 
who knows why, why he thought this. He said, well, I, I just thought we made love and, you know, I miss you. I haven't seen you all summer. And I got to really say to him, like, this is no. And, you know, we're never call me again. And you have to watch how you behave with others. Of course, now I would know many things and counseling and, you know, I w- there was so much else would be available, but it was kind of making it up as I went. And I'm glad that I, I did confront him. I think it helped me a lot in subsequent years. Nina, you're such a pioneer. I have to tell you, such a pioneer. I mean, there are groups of women who actually will guide survivors into confronting rapists in exactly in that kind of scenario in public parks and public places where they can't escape. You know, the women will surround the rapist and the survivor and then they confront them and then they just walk away. And and I could see this because it's this is um classic sort of a radical feminist reaction or response to someone when they know there's no justice. Right. That's amazing to hear. Thank you. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing, but, but it, my sense of my self taking care of myself, you know, where I couldn't during the rape, it, there was some strength that in there. And I think it was very helpful, you know, to, and then I did later other things. I mean, I was still very depressed. I went to my first year of college quite depressed because I, I never wanted to confide in my, my parents anymore. Um, and I felt very isolated and still, uh, you know, so many things easily triggered. I still to this day, when I enter a room, I know where I can get out of the room. I know where the doors and the windows are. I don't like to be enclosed in, in lots of rooms. I, I want to know where an escape exit is. Um, and I was like that at college. I gave up dance. I started, I developed an eating disorder and was quite depressed. But I did uh, seek counseling at college. So we didn't know people who went to therapists in 1971. We really didn't. It was never mentioned. It was actually a shameful thing, again. But I sought that that help out in college. And that was the beginning of, of healing. So that was great. You know, by the end of the following year, I, I was more optimistic and, and, and coming out of my depression. Do you know what I like to think about, you know, because I, I was the first public case similar to yours. And like you, um, always know where the door is. I would, as I travel the country, believe it or not, there are so many nights I rearranged the, the furniture in the r- room where I was staying so I could not sleep next to the wall so I could be closer to the door. I'd move the whole bed. Yep. Um, but yep. but what, I, 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 what I like to think about is you are before me in the case history here. And what I think is interesting is neither of us really had context or a conversation to put around our experience. There was no narrative around us. It was silence. But both of us had a gut instinct of perseverance and solid belief that what happened to us was wrong. And I'd love to hear more about where that grounding in your own self-worth came from, because I think it carried you through in your fortitude to confront him and your belief that it was wrong. So I, I like thinking about innate strength that you clearly had, because I think it's something that we want, I want our survivors, our listeners to hear more about is how do I capture that innate strength? Um, what do you, what things do you think in your life before this happened that put you in that sort of mindset overall? Yeah. I mean, I, I thank a great question. I, I do, I basically had, had an, a very loving family. And even though that was a real um, schism between my mom and I, you know, it can be complicated with teenagers and their parents. So, but, but there was a lot that I uh, gained and learned in my home. You know, I had a large loving family and younger siblings um, I had a lot of responsibilities. I was taught to value my brain and and to strive as much as I could in education, you know, wherever I would go, and, and to believe in 
in my strength in that way, in, in creative arts. When you say, I was taught, who was teaching you to believe in yourself? Your mom, your dad, your faith, your school, your teachers, your coach, your who, your who, who? Yeah, all of that, you know, and I, we did have a, a, um, a connection with our faith, you know, our Jewish community. Mm -hmm. um, I had grandparents who were very um, important to us. And I did have a lot of role models for a lot of things. It was just, you know, this, it, it this was such a dramatic thing, like falling through the looking glass or, you know, falling into a hole. I mean, until that time, um, you know, the world seemed to be opening up with lots of opportunities and, you know, higher education. I, I had a grandfather who pushed us to just, to, to imagine getting a PhD. He encouraged me to do that, which I eventually did. That was like the first person in our, woman in our family, first, first person in our family to do that. So there were many strengths that were, um, grown in all the, us children. So I had all of that. And, um, that those were great, great underpinnings for me, I think. Um, and then the creative arts for sure. And, and that was something so important later, um, both in my work and also healing from trauma and working with children who'd been traumatized. So that was a, a thread that went all through my life gave me a lot and enabled me to heal more and, and kind of be part of the healing for others. And maybe we can talk about that for a while. Tell us about what's happening in your life now and, and, um, and how you got to the place where you were, you know, backtracking a little, like, how did you get to the place where you were doing this work with kids, but what led up to that? And how did you get into, you know, working on doing your poetry and your writing and the creative arts for healing? So I always wrote, I wrote poetry since sixth grade, and that was a great way to process anything in the world. And even that first year in college, when I was so depressed, I was writing poetry. Thank goodness I'd given up the dancing, but poetry and drawing too. So, um, so that was just, it was, you know, I couldn't, I didn't tell anybody, you know, the counselor I told, I didn't tell people for years about this. And I didn't write poems about my, my, my rape until this year, right? So last year, I really started to write about it 50 years later, and get some of those poems published. But, um, but I wrote, I wrote. And so I, my voice, I was growing my voice, and I was hearing my voice. But I um, was a special ed teacher initially. And I um, was working on children's writing developments. So that was my area of, of interest and research. So and I taught as a poet in the schools for many years. And then um, I went to art school after I got married and had kids. So that was amazing. Um, my, I have a lovely husband, very supportive. And I went to art school in my 30s as I was a teacher. I went part time as our kids were, were going to school. So I started to teach poetry writing in interfaith communities, kids who were underserved, a lot of kids in the inner city. I joined with a group of other painters, poets, dancers, and you know we, we teach all kinds of workshops, encouraging uh, kids to express their voices about anything. We are seeing a lot of situational trauma, a lot of trauma with gun violence. We are seeing a lot of sexual trauma. And then in those cases, we do, you know, call the correct organizations and we make sure teachers and, you know, um, and, you know, authorities are told. So it, surprisingly, sometimes we're the first people that the children um, let let know about their stories because we come in, we might be a poetry, poetry teachers or art teachers and suddenly they are sharing very deep things. So um, I just kind of fell into it. I didn't say, oh, you know, I've got to do this because of my experience. It just seemed a natural progression. It helped me so much that um, it was just natural to kind of go in that direction. Can I ask you a question, backtracking a little bit? Um, you said you gave up dancing and that's what you were really wanting to do. How did that 
was it because of the rape that you gave it up? And what was it like for you to feel that you feel that you needed to give it up? It was really hard. I mean, it, I had less agency over my body during and after the rape, right? And so, and my emotions and, you know, my moods and my behaviors, you know, here I was with an eating disorder. I didn't know about eating disorders, you know, that's a way to control something. So um, I didn't feel like the, the power of my body then. So, but, but my voice, I, my voice wanted to be heard. So the poetry grew. And then, and then in my thirties, kind of imagery, not, you know, with nonverbal imagery grew becoming a painter. So, um, yeah, I always, I still love to dance at parties and weddings and bar mitzvahs. My body loves to dance and move. And, um, it was really hard to give that up, but it's okay. You know, I, I've had a very lucky life in general, and I've, you know, been able to do all these other art forms. I'm wondering how, um, keeping all that in mind, how did all of this influence um, ra raising your children? Yes, great question. I have wonderful children. I have two boys and a girl, and they're in their 30s now. Um, when they were teenagers um, and starting to date, I did tell them my story. So when they got to be the age where I saw they were dating and it meant one thing to tell my daughter in my mind, although that's, you know, that's my own bias, right? Cause I identified as a female with my daughter um, and the boys, you know, when you're with a partner and you're exploring and there's sexual um, stuff happening, checking in, no means no. And this is what happened to your mother. And also, I'm just a normal average person and they don't have to take care of me. Since I told them this story, I've had therapy. It's not their job to take care of me, but I want them to know this can really happen. And, you know, I, I said that I thought the boy I was with was under the influence of drugs, whatever. It ha who knows? But they were shocked and it was upsetting uh, for them to hear. And I had told my husband, of course, so he was very supportive. But I did speak of these things. And, you know, we there were so many more supports now in our community, you know, counseling and education, sex education. They had a great teacher at their high school who talked about consent. And so, um, but I was part of this fabric of what they heard. Um, if I heard of any of my kids' friends doing risky things that I thought would put them at risk sexually, like I would actually speak to them. I'd ask my kids first, my daughter with several, a couple of her friends over time were doing things where they were clearly vulnerable and, you know, in isolated places. And after I'd heard, I asked if it was okay if I just talked with them and I did. So that was intrusive, but I, I, um, it, it, it all, they were heard me and, and I, I think it was okay that I did that, you know? Well, I, you know, honestly, the only question I have is, is, um, really about what you're doing now. You've published your book of poetry. What what do you have planned for future projects? And I, are you, you're still working with this organization. Yeah, yes, definitely. And I've started to teach adults poetry writing workshops too. I'm going to publish another book um, in a couple of months. Um, I'm, you know, on this topic, you know, I, I, become more uh, parent, like I'm not hiding anymore, which I did so much in those early years. Um, so I think just for me, um, any, any way that I can enhance the ability of folks to express their stories in a safe community, that's what I'll do. And it can be any kind of a story, but that their, their voices really can be heard and, and, and speak about this, you know, so I will if asked and I will own it. You know, I was really uh, moved when Dr. Blas Christine Bosley Ford spoke up. Um, that really galvanized me to start writing these poems. So I just think the more, the more it's kind of pe people, everyone knows this happens to people, people know. It's not just some stranger who got raped or someone in another country and um 
you know, just the, the more that I can speak up that way. What lessons, what would you like the listeners to take away um, from your experience? The healing can happen, but I also make room for that younger self who was, who was raped, who I carry with me. And I acknowledge that part of myself and, and, and patient and care, give care to that part of myself, which is hyper vigilant, you know, which can really, you know, want to avoid certain um, interactions at times. And that person has that younger self that um, has influenced a lot of my decisions and reactions in good and bad ways. But to recognize that it, that younger self is trying to keep me safe and, and no, and I've also had a very full and meaningful life with a lot of intimacy, but that there's still work that I have to do. And it doesn't help me to pretend any of this didn't happen. So the secrecy around it when I was young was so destructive to me and to the, my relationship uh, with others. So that's my, my advice is to really get support. Well, thank you so much, Adina. That was wonderful advice. And I was, um, thank you for sharing your story with us. Thank you so much, Dina, for joining us. Um, and thank you also uh, for sharing your, your story, your journey, your, your many, many success points. And for our listeners, thank you for being present, for joining us, for joining Dina and her her story and listening to her and, and finding hope and healing in her um, many examples of, you know, success. Um, if you found anything challenging or uh, difficult, please don't hesitate to process what you've heard. Um, reach out for support. And you can visit the takebackthenight.org website for a list of resources and information about the legal support hotline. We are never alone. There are many walking with us in healing, in supporting survivors, and in ending sexual violence. This is Katie Kessner. And this is Claire Kaplan. Be strong. Let us together shatter the silence and end the violence. Thank you.